this part. So um, today I'll cover a bit more complex, um, a bit more complex part of Go modules uh, that actually um, was was most the the most hard part for me when I just um, when I just started learning models. Uh, it, it was not hard, but uh, an obvious something kind of okay. Uh, it, it looks too complex. Why why just simple dependencies management needs some kind of proxy or, or whatever it is. Um, and today I'll try to disclose uh, some specifics of that proxies and just show uh, how does it work and what does it do and what is it for. I hope it will be informative. I don't um, then promise that I'll cover everything, but let's start. And as well, I expect that this presentation will be pretty, pretty short. Um, so let's go to proxies directly. Mm. Let's start from the discovery of Go code. Uh, so Go modules may be um, discovered in two ways. Uh, these ways are module proxy servers and the old flavor, uh, old-fashioned old uh, version control systems. Actually, as in previous version, uh, versions of Go, when we just used GoGet to uh, fetch version control system, we, we still can use version control system, um, version control systems like Git, uh, Subversion, or Mercurial uh, to fetch our code. But the proxy is uh, almost new, <laughs> a bit, um, I'd say a bit uh, old one, but um, but for, for someone it may be pretty new concept. Um, so a module proxy is an HTTP server that can respond with information about modules and module contents as well. Uh, when we do some manipulation with remote modules uh, on our local machine, for example, the load the refresh, uh, the, the, the load refresh version, um, Go common um, will start from communicating to the module proxy. And um, if there is no module found, it will use version control system. Uh, however, we can control the behavior uh, that behavior of us usage of code proxies or um, version control systems with environment variables. And I'll, I'll show them in a couple of slides. So let's just discuss Go proxy protocol. Uh, this protocol is responsible for transferring modules data and modules metadata. Uh, this protocol requires uh, four HTTP methods uh, to be implemented by some HTTP server. Um, this, and, and there is one uh, optional method. Uh, These methods are required to support the communication between client and server, which is, which is expected. Um, each method is communicated by GET requests without any specific headers and params. Their paths uh, are already the containers for all the needed parameters. And uh, as you can see, all those uh, paths, all those methods are uh, actually not methods, but kind of uh, URLs or URL patterns are pretty simple mm, some of them so we we have uh, a version listening um, version listing um, endpoint uh, version information point uh, a couple of endpoints for module and uh, actually uh, for module file and for zip file that contains all the data of uh, all the contents of our modules and just to an optional point that uh, can give us the latest version. Let's move forward. And uh, how do we how do we work with um, 
how do we work with configuration of Go proxy? How 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 can we at least understand well, where is where is it located? Where, what is the server? So uh, Go proxy usage is configured through a set of environment variables. Uh, there are uh, actually that's the, the set of that environment variables is is pretty big. So there are um, variables related to some DB, to, um, to some uh, privacy and kind of, you know, pri privacy related stuff, but we will cover only a couple of those variables. Uh, these are go proxy and go no proxy as they're the most important. Uh, so go proxy just configure, um, a list of possible proxies to verify and fetch the code. Uh, proxies will be used in the order they are mentioned in the list. So the first one, like in this example, proxy go and or will be um, used the first to, to fetch the model data. Uh, if this proxy fails, then we will use some proxy.com and only after some proxy.com fails, I mean, a request uh, fails, uh, then uh, we will use a specific value direct. Uh, direct value means that we will work directly with a version control system without any Go proxy, uh, without usage of Go proxy protocol and Go proxy server. Um, there are two, cup, uh, two types of separator for our Go proxy string for our CSV Go proxy string. Um, it is a comma and a pipe. Pipe means that any kind of error that appears with proxy um, that goes before the pipe will be ignored. And uh, if if we cannot reach this proxy, if we get a I don't know internal server or sorry internal server or, or um, I don't know, unauthenticated or kind of that. Uh, it doesn't matter which kind of error appears, we go to the next proxy to, in this case, some proxy.com. In case of we have a comma, then it means if in this example, some proxy.com fails, there are only two response codes may cause a recover of that error. Uh, it, um, so those errors, uh, th those response codes are 404 error and 410. Uh, it's uh, not found and uh, I just don't remember, gone, 410, yeah, it, it should be gone. Um, one more thing is, is a specific value of, so the, the, the right to uh, special, the right to special values of uh, Go proxy items. Uh, the first one is direct, the another one is off. Off means that we don't use any Go proxy, any way to fetch the dependencies. In this case, if proxy go len or fails with error not 404 or 410, we will have, uh, e even, e even if that is error 404 or 410, we will have an error because off doesn't allow us even use the direct VCS model to load, kind of that. And one more interesting stuff, we also can use our local mods, uh, module cache to just as a Go proxy, like uh, writing this, writing this kind of pattern in Go proxy variable will fetch all the modules when, when you use any Go get, Go, uh, Go mod to load or any kind of Go mod commands that may fetch or require some modules, it will use it will use your local cache of 
of your modules. Let's move forward. And um, there is also a GONO proxy environment variable that I mentioned. So GONO proxy is a list of wild cards of modules that should be downloaded directly from version control system. It's pretty simple. And it says that don't touch any go proxy, just go to github.com. So if, if there is a prefix github.com, don't touch uh, any go proxy, go directly to github.com and download the code from github.com. The same works for golengorg x. So if you see golengorg x uh, uh, in the prefix, just go to, uh, to the version control system directly and download the code. The same way we, we can, uh, for example, mention a um, some particular uh, package for that. Um, okay, so let's go through the process of using the proxy during the code builds during the code build. Um, just let's let's go through that step by step. So. After computing the build list by reading Go mod files and performing minimum version selection algorithm, Go comment reads all the packages needed for the build. If a package is not provided by any model in the build list, Go looks for the model and adds a module requirement on its latest version in Go mod. Uh, you can see that each time when you add some package to your so, so some dependency to record and it's not included in go mod and when you do go mod and lodge or go build or any kind of module you were common you will see that some additional rows appear in your go mod and go some files and when the go comment computes the build list it loads the go mod file for each model in, in the tree of dependencies. Um, if go mod file is not in the cache, if go mod file of our dependency is not in the cache, the go comment will, will download it from the proxy. The same, um, so models source code is distributed through zip files. When we download something from from Go proxy, uh, we actually download a zip file, which will be extracted into our module cache. If a zip file is not in the cache and it's needed for some reason, well, actually not for some reason, but for if we directly need that dependency, if we, uh, if minimum version selection algorithm decided that that code that the particular version will be used in our build. So the Go command will download it. You may also remember that Go some file may contain uh, cryptographic hashes of Go mode files or hashes of entire modules. Actually, that hashes of entire modules are hashes of mm, hashes of zip files. Uh, after downloading the Go mod file or zip archive uh, of the module, the Go command computes a hash and checks that it matches a hash in the main model's Go sum file. So <laughs> here is kind of um, Go pseudocode to, to illustrate the process. Um, we download. We download the go mod file or um, zip file. We count the hash and we are trying to compare it to hash into our go sum file or in um, so called go sum db. Uh, go sum db is a place, is well, we, we can imagine that it's a service that, ha that has a big, big, big um, go sum file with a lot of hashes that it aware is about. Um, kind of that. So if uh, during our build, 
any go some file hash or uh, go some db hash is not uh, equal to the our downloaded version our build will fail with a security error it's kind of that uh, and how does how does module so let's imagine that we added a module to to a package oh, sorry a, a package um, a package to our file as, 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 as a dependency and we want to download a module for that package it's pretty common stuff but sometimes we need a package uh, somewhere in in deep of the module and how how will uh, go locate that module so to find it it will traverse the path of the module going from the deepest to the uh, highest part of that path uh, if we want to find for example golang or xnet html package it will first so go common first will go to uh, golang or xnet html then golang or xnet then golang or x and then golang org in our case golang org xnet is uh, so it is a, it is a module because it contains mod file uh, that's why it will stop on the uh, step of checking golang org xnet and uh, will fetch a module file of that module and uh, will add that module as a dependency to our mod file. For example, if Golang or uh, so when when this algorithm um, fetches module file when when it lo look ups for um, for the module file, it will choose the deepest mod module that it can. If we could have so if we have a module inside of HTML package, so the module, uh, the dependency that will uh, that will be added to our main Go mod file, that dependency will be Golangorg X nat HTML, so the full path of our package, because the package is actually inside the root of the module. Kind of that. And uh, I guess that's the last slide. Um, as I said, uh, module code is distributed through zip files. And those files have some limitation that we should be aware of publishing Go modules. Uh, the file size and the total uncompressed size of the content of, of the module uh, is limited to um, 500 megabytes. Go module files may be up to 16 megabytes in size. That in size, um, that is also a limitation of uh, license files. So they also may not be bigger than 16 megabytes, and that's very important when we publish in our um, when we publish in our models because. Sometimes we need a video inside of our repository, for example, for testing purposes or kind of that. Um, in some cases, license file can, can be too big. I, I just can't um, imagine that, but let's suppose that it's real. Um, well, huge Go mod file is almost impossible, but all of that limitations are, um, so they, they protect proxies, users, and all the Go ecosystem from denial of service attack. For example, if you publish a repository with model bigger than um, 500 megabyte, it happens when we include some media archives, um, we, may, we may avoid that limitation. Um, 
to, to avoid it, we have to tag our release versions that contain, uh, that contain only the parts needed to build the code. So if we want to release a very, very large uh, repository, we have to create a commit or a branch or whatever, just, just, just a separate commit or branch uh, and tag that commit or tag that branch with um, our release. And only after that, when we query that release with our Go modules. So, sorry, just for, forgot to mention. Um, we have to create a separate commit or a separate branch with all the huge files deleted. And uh, after that, we can tag that commit, tag that branch and use it as go module. And there will not be any issues with that. Um, if for some reason you rely on any specific types of files, just be aware that uh, no symbolic links, no empty directories, no process network files, or kind of irregular files um, are allowed. Even timestamps and metadata of that files will be rewritten. So just remember that you push the, you push your model into a zipper here. And uh, well, and it's not very um, full featured and it doesn't behave always like your main file system, especially Go models have to be uh, cross platform. So uh, when Windows or Unix or I don't know, maybe some other uh, FreeBSD or Mac operating system requires some qualities from a file uh, that that may break the compatibility with any another operating system so this these requirements are just just for uh, for keeping our models cleaner um, and there is one more important scene um, you may be already aware about that but no files with uh, case insensitive uh, equal names are allowed. So if you have, uh, for example, uh, I don't know, file main.go was uh, just written in lowercase and main.go written in uppercase, uh, you're not permitted to do that. And actually Go compiler will uh, prevent from such such, such builds or such Go files, but be aware that um, if you, for example, include some JSON, CSV, whatever configs, Docker files, uh, they should have um, always different case insensitive paths. Um, kind of that, kind of that, that was pretty fast. So if anyone have any questions, please ask. If that was even uh, even descriptive.